Okay, here's something that, that were rarely eaten, fatty meats. Okay, am I suggesting? Now, I've changed my position a little bit on this, and I, I've got a, a new revision of my book that's coming out in December. And so my position has changed a little bit. And I believe that under the umbrella of a paleo-type diet, I don't think that fattier meats, particularly if you're active, like people in this group, I don't believe that they have a negative effect or a very minimal effect on your health and well-being. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So here's, uh, here's America's favorite meat. Over here on the left is ground beef. Okay, that is the favorite. That's the numero uno. And look at it. If you look at it by, this is not by um, uh, weight. This is by calories. And that's how you have to look at these meats, are by calories. So ground beef is 64% fat by calories, 33% protein by calories. That's how you have to look at it. So you go to the supermarket and you go, oh man, I'm getting what? 90%, is that 90%, 10, 95, 5? Isn't that how it, they, they label it? That is so misleading. You know how much fat 2% milk has in it by energy? About 33%. You have to look at it by energy rather than by weight. And so when we look at these things now by, by energy, by calories, in the protein to fat ratio, they start looking a lot different. So these really aren't uh, meats. These are fat disguised as meat, aren't they? Well, you're okay with that. Well, uh, not really. I mean, it depends on where you're coming from. It's like if you are... Well, I'm not okay with the processed meat. Absolutely not okay with salami. Not okay with hot dogs. And not okay with bacon. I'm a little bit more okay with this. A little bit less okay with this. And a little bit less okay with this. Why am I uncomfortable with salami? Is because the fat to protein mixture is nothing that occurs in nature. What it is, is there's, there's a butcher over here. And he grinds up a bunch of meat, and he throws in a bunch of fat. So it's totally at the whim of the butcher, or the food processing plant that makes this stuff. They determine these fat mixtures. If you get a wild animal, I don't know if any of you have ever seen a skinned wild animal. We've done studies of it at CSU. And they don't look anything like what you get out here in Greeley in the feedlots. But these mixtures are, you can't, you can't find them in a wild animal. You can't, unless you arbitrarily take part of this and mix it in with that. The other problem is, is they put nitrites and nitrates in here. And they do that so that the meat doesn't spoil. But in our gut, the nitrites and the nitrates are changed into compounds called nitrosamines. And nitrosamines are potent carcinogens. And so the most recent epidemiologic evidence tells us that these types of fats, these processed meats, are associated with colon cancer. And we believe that these types of meat actually aren't. <coughs> There are healthier meats. I don't have a problem if people eat these um, occasionally, you know, and if you're healthy and fit, you can even eat more of them. Uh, but if you're overweight, insulin resistant, and you can use this as a crutch. You can go out and eat these kind of fatty meats day in and day out, eat raisins, and you can have the same characteristics that we have on the Western diet. You can have a high fatty diet, high glycemic load, and a, a diet that's low in protein. Because you saw the numbers here. These aren't, this is not very high protein. If I, you know, if I should take a, a venison, I didn't contrast this here, but a venison or an elk steak, it's 80% protein. Okay, so, and the protein is the important part. You've heard about branched chain amino acids. John talked to you a little bit about those. Not yet. Not yet, okay. Valine, leucine, isoleucine, these are the amino acids that immediately stimulate muscle protein synthesis in the post-exercise period. So, if you get branch chain amino acid, let me just put these up here. You may want to write these down. Where's it? We have a. Okay. We've got a little sidetrack here, but I'll, I definitely want to finish up because I know we started off saying 45 minutes. How long am I into this? I have. Okay. So, branch chain. Amino acid. And these are valine, leucine, L-E-U, C-I-N-E, and isoleucine. These are what you guys need to get in that post-exercise window. These are what's going to cause protein synthesis in your muscles. So 
Those are three crucial amino acids to get. When you go out and if you're buying supplements or whatever, I would make sure that you get those. And the closer you can get them, you have about an hour, maybe two hours after you exercise to get those branched chain amino acids. And an artificial way of doing it, the best way of doing it is after you finish up and you start to feel hungry again, is to get those branched chain amino acids. Get them along with some high glycemic load carbs to replenish your muscle glycogen stores as well. Hey doc, um, how fast does the food actually go through the stomach? It should take about an hour to actually pass through the stomach into the... Uh, well, the you know, it, it varies from person to person. It depends on what you put in your, your stomach. The food... Or, if there was no fat in there, it would be faster absorption, it's, it's right? It's faster, exactly. So if you put fat in, it slows everything down. One of the tricks... Anybody here heard of Joe Friel? Joe is uh, my co-author on the second book, and he's a, a noted U.S. Olympic uh, triathlete coach. One of the things he recommends, and what works for his athletes, is to get um, egg white protein, which is somewhat paleo, and mix egg white protein <laughs> with some high glycemic low carbs. In my second book, we talk about how to do it. And that uh, serves a double whammy, is it restores muscle glycogen, and it also gives you the shot of those branched chain amino acids, which we now know um, help to cause muscle synthesis. Okay, if we look at wild animals, they're completely different than domesticated animals. They go through this cyclic period of being fat and lean, fat and lean. And so most of the time out of the year, they're very, very lean. They're like the caribou rather than the, the uh, sheep. And so the sheep, or any domesticated animal, um, it relies upon us to provision it with food. So we give it fodder and grass and whatever, and the animal gets fat. And we're not stupid. We don't kill the animal when it's lean, do we? We kill it out here really when it's as fat as possible. So that's how we do things, and that is very artificial. So humans that had to rely upon wild animals, they had to rely upon the amount of fat that was in the animal when it was available. Here in Colorado, as we're approaching late summer, the animals are getting fat. And as we go into winter and early spring, they get very, very lean. So this is uh, what happens to animals. This is just caribou. You can see this is the, the 12 months of the year. And you can see how the body fat goes from being very uh, in summer. Uh, oh, this is January, February, March, April, May, June, July. You can see the, the peak comes here in summer and in the fall. This is in North America. And then we fall right off here. And the, the take home point is here is the fattest wild animals ever get. You can see here's a, uh, um, this is a mature bull, bull caribou. It gets to 25% body fat, but maybe one or two months out of the year. When we slaughter a cow in a feedlot, the animal is at 30% fat. So we're always eating 30% fat. We're never eating down here. And if you're a hunter gatherer, you're reliant and had to eat down there. So this is just another way of looking at those three animals. This is an average showing that seven months out of the year, their body fat is 3%, the entire year is 6.8. We eat animals from the feedlot that are 30% fat or more. And this is how the, the types of fat change over the year. And you can see then that uh, they tend to have low saturated fats, higher monounsaturates, higher polyunsaturates. And those are consistent with some of the experimental evidence that helped to prevent against cardiovascular disease.